Speaking of homework number two, um, who's got, did anybody have any questions about homework number two? I think I've answered a few questions over the weekend or to individuals, but anybody have some, some um, relatively quick questions about homework number two? Remember that it's due at one o'clock this afternoon. That was awesome. <clears throat> Jump in if you have some questions. No questions? No questions? Okay. Well, I'm going to assume that that's good news, right? <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to give you the good, I'm going to give you some good news that my plan is that we are not gonna have afternoon class. I know, exactly. <laughs> Party, right? <laughs> Party on Zoom at 12.30, yes. So, um, yes, I, I have a uh, meeting this afternoon and I really do wanna get these graded because I wanna get them back to you tomorrow. And so um, this, it also just feels like a reasonable time to have an afternoon off. So we're, we will have class this morning. We will not have class this afternoon. Um, remember that your homework number two is due at one o'clock, right? So make sure you get to that to me. I will grade these. I will get them back to you hopefully sometime tonight. And then um, tomorrow morning uh, or tomorrow afternoon, one of the two, we will spend a little bit of time going over it. Also, we'll have a little bit of time um, tomorrow to go think about your, your um, first exam, okay? So let me just say a couple of things about the first exam before we get started. Your first exam is gonna be on chapters one through seven, okay? Chapters one through seven. So it will cover what we talk about this morning. It will not cover what we talk about tomorrow morning, okay? So tomorrow we're gonna talk about chapter eight, that will not be on the exam. It will be, uh, it will just be on chapters one through seven. Here is my uh, plan, is that it is gonna be a three hour timed exam. So I will send you the exam by email on, at 9 a.m. on Wednesday morning, and you will get it back to me by noon on Wednesday morning, Central Standard Time. It will be an open book, open note exam. Having said that, uh, time is going to be an issue. So, you know, you will not be able to just simply, uh, well, first off, some of the questions are, are gonna be unique and you won't be able to just kind of figure, figure it out looking through your notes. But also, you know, three hours is probably gonna be a, a, a bit of a time constraint for many of you. And so, in other words, if you think you can just kind of, you know, um, flip through your notes and try to figure everything out on the fly, that's gonna put a real time constraint. So, you know, I would honestly suggest that you study as if the book was not open test, open, or open notes, open book, right? Because I think that will get you more prepared to, to do the exam. Um, yeah, the, the exam is really going to be, um, I'm going to try to pick questions that, you know, roughly are, are, are kind of equate to the amount of time that we, sent, we spent on material, right? So in other words, I'm going to try to um, pick a, a mix of questions that kind of cover a lot of the things that we talked about uh, last week and today, right? And so the material, the, the time spent on the material hopefully will roughly correlate to how much time it's spent, things are spent with on the exam. In terms of what the exam is going to be, it's going to be a mix of problems, kind of like what you've seen on homework number two, or I'm sorry, homework number one and number two, but it will also include maybe a, more kind of questions about definitions or intuitive questions. I haven't asked these many, these kind of questions as much on the homeworks just because I want to focus kind of on the problem solving part and on the homeworks, but you might also get some more, you know, as I said, intuition or um, definition sorts of questions on the exam. Um, anyway, we can, we can definitely talk about the exam more tomorrow, um, and we will talk about it more tomorrow, but in the meantime, does anybody have any, any questions about 
the exam as it's going to be set up? Um, hi, Tilt. I do have uh, a few questions. Yes. Um, so, like, how many questions do we have? I, I mean, I don't think that really makes much difference, right? <laughs> Most there's going to be okay. questions with multiple subparts to them. So, you know, like I said, the exam the exam is going to be three hours. I'm really kind of planning on the exam, you know, that if, if you're prepared, that, that the exam should take less than that. But, you know, I know some of you work slower. And so, you know, you, you, you have to keep in mind that you only have three hours for this exam, right? And plan accordingly. Um, yes, yeah, so you have suggested that we have to do our homework mm -hmm. um, about two or three hours. So I guess is the exam going to be the, like the same length as the homeworks we do, we did? Uh, I, I I don't want to say that you're going to get the same questions as you got on your homework, but yes, some of the questions on your homework are going to be similar to questions that are are going to be on the exam, um, and if if not exactly similar, similar in type, right? So yeah, I mean I, I would say pretty much all the questions on homework number two would be questions that I could ask on the exam, right? Or questions similar to that. Uh, yeah, so like, um, is the exam going to be like the same length as the homework we did? Yeah, so as I said, they will not be the exact same questions, right? So, but they will be similar questions. Some of them will, some of them will be quite similar and some will be you know, generally similar. But, but the, the homeworks are, you know, part of the intention of the homeworks is to give you some practice for the kind of things that you'll see on your exam. So I, th I think you will see some of the questions on the homework um, show up in one way, shape, or form on the exam. Okay. I think, so, she's, um, I think she's asking, um, will it be the same length as the homework? Yeah. Relatively? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, same length? Well, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, there, there's probably going to be more questions on the on the exam than the homework, but I think some of the questions on the exam are going to be a little bit more straightforward, kind of of uh, almost short answer definitions, that kind of stuff. So you know, it, it's not going to look exactly like like your homework, but your homeworks are going to help. Okay. Thank you. So um, we're going to do um, the exam together. So like um, the students in China will be do the exam together. That is my plan. If there's a problem with that, I think we should probably talk about that separate from or outside of class. Okay, but yes, my okay. plan is that 9, 9 a.m. just this time that we usually start class, I will send you an email. It will have the exam in it. You will fill it out. And then you'll send it back to me by 12 o'clock American Central Standard Time. Okay, I see. Thank you. So if, if we all have to be on Zoom together. So I, I haven't really thought about that. I, I don't think I'm going to make you sit there and, I, and be on Zoom. I mean, I know a lot of professors make you sit there with your Zoom camera on. Um, I don't think I'm going to do that. I'm just going to trust that you don't I mean, like I said, this is open notes, open book, but that doesn't mean that you can just email everybody and share answers, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to trust that you don't do that and also trust that, I, you know, when I grade all these, I can kind of, I feel like I have a pretty good nose for people who are copying answers between themselves. So, um, no, I, I don't, I don't really want to sit here and watch you on Zoom, and I don't. You, you probably don't want to be on Zoom for the entire time. So that's not my plan. Okay. So if you have, um, let me just say one more thing about the exam. I'm going to send you the exam in a Word file. You'll fill it in in a Word file. Once again, if you need to take pictures on your camera and in, put it in, or you know whatever you need to do. Um, I've, I've tried not to ask very many questions that actually ask you to do graphs because I realize that graphs are kind of awkward to do. So I can't say that I'm not going to ask you to do any, 
I, I think I am, I think there's at least one question we're gonna ask you to do a graph, but if you can just take a picture and put it in, that would be great. Or if you can't do that, if you can describe the graph, right? So in other words, describe that it's a, a standard solo graph, like the one in your book, figure 2.1 or whatever, or, and, and this shifts and that happens, right? You can, you can do that too. Um, and of course, during the exam, if you always, if you want to send me an email, uh, you always can, and I can, I can try to answer questions, right? But I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you a Word document, and then you're gonna send me a Word document back by email. Okay. All right. So I download. It, yeah. Is the, so like you know how like I type mine on Google Docs. I don't trust Word like to save stuff <laughs> just in case something happens. So <laughs> if I download a Word document like I did for homework one. Does that come across just fine? If you download a Word document. You like mean, uh, what you got for number my number one homework? You, would that? You, that that for, works fine. Okay. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure. I don't, I don't trust words. Had too many bad experiences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever, whatever you did for homework number one, it worked fine. It worked fine. Okay. All right, well, then let's jump into what we want to talk about this morning, given that we're having kind of a, a short day. Um, I want to talk about chapter seven, right? And chapter seven is the last, not only the last part of the material um, for your first exam, but it's really kind of the last chapter from what, I'll, from what the, the first third of the class, okay? So up to this point in time in, in class, we've been talking about long run issues in economics, right? And so this is one, maybe, maybe chapter eight next, maybe, maybe actually, you know, I say that tomorrow's is the last long run chapter. But we, you know, last week we talked about long run issues and economic growth. <laughs> Today we want to talk about long run issues related to the labor market. So some of the topics we're going to be talking about today is we'll talk about labor markets, we'll talk about unemployment, we're going to talk a little bit about um, inequality and wages. We'll talk about why unemployment is higher in some countries than in others. We'll talk about what determines unemployment in the short run, what determines it in the long run. These are all some of the topics that we'll talk about. And um, yeah, so, so let's jump in. To begin with, oh, of course, this is not sharing. I have to tell you that I'm a little, uh, a little anxious about today's lecture because whatever has been going on in Iowa City, um, we've been having some real internet problems here. And also Zoom has been working somewhat funkily, <laughs> I'll say, the last day or two. So I hope that everything works well. All right, so the labor market. Two calculations or two def definitions, equations that we should be familiar with. The first is, what do we mean by the unemployment rate? Okay, obviously what unemployment is gonna be one of the things we wanna talk about here. How do we actually calculate unemployment? So how unemployment is calculated is the US La Bureau of Labor Statistics actually surveys 60,000 households every month. And based on these surveys, they calculate everybody into one of three categories. You are either employed, right? And what employed means is that you are working and you have a job. That job is more than 20 hours a week. You are unemployed, meaning you do not have a job that's 20 hours a week and you would like one, or you are classified as not in the labor force, okay? What is not in the labor force? Not in the labor force means you don't have a job and you're not actively looking for a job. So everyone gets classified into one of those three categories. Based on that, we calculate the unemployment rate. And the unemployment rate, as you see in this formula here, is just the number of people who are unemployed divided by the number of people who are unemployed plus employed. Another way you can think about this is we usually call the number of people unemployed plus the number of people employed as the labor force, okay? So, you, so everybody who either has a job or, or is looking for a job is in the labor force. If, you're not, if you don't have a job and you're not looking for a job, you are not in the labor force, 
So the unemployment rate is not calculated here as a percent of the population. That is the most important thing to know about this. It's, it is instead calculated as a percent of the labor force. Why not a percent of the population? Well, we don't want to count grandma as unemployed, right? We don't want to count a stay-at-home mom as unemployed. We don't want to count um, you, right, college students, as unemployed, all right? And so, because that's really going to dis, um, that's going to um, distort our figures. Of course, the way that we do calculate it is also distorted in ways that we'll talk about here in a minute. Another very useful statistics related to this is the labor force participation rate. And what is the labor force participation rate? This is just looking at the labor force divided by the population. And usually when we talk about the population, we only include the 16 and older population, right? So we don't include little kids in this, in this population. So labor force participation rate is really looking at what percentage of the population is actually in the labor force, right? And once again, labor force means either has a job or is looking for a job. Okay, so that's how we calculate unemployment, right? And that's how we calculate the labor force participation rate. Let's actually spend just a, a brief minute or two looking at the most recent data here in the U.S. for the labor force participation rate, which is the blue line, the unemployment rate, which is the red line, and then the green line we won't talk much about, but this is really the employment divided by the population ratio. But we, we won't talk about the green line. We'll focus on the, the blue line and the red line. First off, let's look at the red line, the unemployment rate. This is looking at the unemployment rate in the United States between 2000 and 2020. Notice that what happens to the unemployment rate during recessions, it tends to go up. So these gray areas here are recessionary periods. And notice that un unemployment went up during 2001, 2002 during the recession. And then we had a huge spike in unemployment during the 2008 financial crisis. And then you will see what's happened here in 2020, right? Where we had a monumental spike in unemployment in March associated with COVID, right? So basically unemployment in March or in that, that first to second quarter of this year went from a little bit under 4% to over 14%. It has since come back down. Today, unemployment is at 6.7%. So it has come back down, but it hasn't, hasn't come all the way back down to what it was before. And of course, one of the real questions in the unemployment rate today, and we'll kind of talk about this a little bit, is to what extent was this increase in unemployment a permanent change and to what extent was it temporary, okay? So in other words, a lot of people who lost their jobs at the beginning of COVID have been hoping that their job would come back as soon as COVID disappeared. And while it is true that many people's jobs have returned, right? Many of those jobs have not yet returned and there's a growing fear among many economists that, that we're gonna be left with a, a, a sustained higher unemployment rate because many jobs that disappear just simply won't come back either because the businesses are gone or because businesses are going to figure out a way to, to, to operate without those workers. So that is a dramatic spike in unemployment, right? At the same time, what's happened to the blue line? This is the labor force participation rate. Notice that we have had a long-term trend of declining labor force participation. Labor force participation in 2000 was um, close to 67%. Before the COVID crisis, it had fallen below 64%. So it had fallen from 67 all the way down to 64. Notice what's happened here during COVID. Labor force participation has fallen quite significantly. And this points to one of the big problems with our unemployment rate, right? Um, if I can kind of skip ahead here in my notes. There are some significant problems with the way that we calculate unemployment. One of them is the way we calculate unemployment ignores discouraged workers. What do I mean by a discouraged worker? A discouraged worker is somebody who's unemployed and then they give up looking for a job. Okay, so these are people who have been unemployed for long periods of time. 
So what happens when you've been unemployed for six months, nine months, 12 months? Well, typically in the US, unemployment insurance lasts for six months. So to get unemployment insurance, you have to go looking for a job. You have to be looking for a job to be able to collect it. But what happens to many people when they've been unemployed for more than six months and their unemployment insurance drops out? They stop looking for a job. So while they might be technically unemployed, once you stop looking for a job, if you're called by the Bureau of Labor Statistics and you say, have you looked for a job in the last three weeks? And you say, no, you are counted as not in the labor force, even though you might consider yourself to be unemployed. And so if we go back and look at this data here, what we see is that this huge spike in unemployment probably underestimates the amount of unemployment. Because notice what happened at the same time, the labor force participation rate dropped. So in other words, a lot of people left the labor force, presumably some of those people left not because they wanted to, but because they, you know, they, they either could not take the risk of being sick, and so they left the, the labor force, or they lost their job and they, they've given up looking for a new job, right? And so, they probably consider themselves to be unemployed, but our unemployment statistics are not gonna consider them to be unemployed. So almost certainly unemployment is underestimated in the United States because of the discouraged worker effect, okay? And during a period like this with COVID, it's probably significantly underestimated, right? So when you see that current unemployment is 6.7%, you really have to kind of view that as a, as a minimum number, right, or a very conservative number. In reality, almost certainly, um, almost certainly many of the people are unemployed, right, but they're just not counted that way in our unemployment statistics. Another big problem with the way that we look at unemployment is that unemployment ignores the duration of unemployment, right? So in other words, to be unemployed for two months is something much different than being unemployed for six months or a year or a year and a half. So, you know, what we see for the most part in typical times, and here, here I'm not talking about what's going on with our COVID economy, but in a typical economy, in a typical economy, when people lose their jobs, they find another job pretty quickly, right? As we're going to talk about here in a minute, there's a lot of churning in the U.S. labor market. And by churning, I mean, People are leaving jobs and getting new jobs all the time, right? So most of the time when people become unemployed, they're unemployed for sh pretty short periods of time. But what do we see during recessions and periods of economic crisis? Some people lose their job and not, they don't just lose their job for a short period of time, they lose it for a long period of time. And once you've lost your job for a long period of time, it becomes much more difficult to get back in the labor market, right? There, are, there is a clear bias against people who have been unemployed for longer periods of time. Part of that bias might be because people in that, that do hiring just say, why hasn't this person had a job? There must be something I don't know about them. But then another part of the bias against people who've been out of the labor market for a long period of time is the longer you're out of the labor market, the more skills you lose, right? When you're working, you're kind of keeping up with skills, right? You're developing new skills, you're learning new technologies, but once you drop out of the labor market for six months or a year or two years, right? It's really hard to get back into it. Um, I was just, just as an aside, I, this kind of struck me this, this, um, this weekend where I was talking to my sister who um, is a social worker, but she basically dropped out of the labor market for three years, right? In part because she had kids and there were some other things going on in her personal life and then they moved. And so she, she really kind of gave up a job and now has just gotten back in the labor market. And she's just kind of talking about all the ways that, all, all the skills that she's lost over the three years, right? Or all the skills she never developed, including the fact that she's just amazed that nobody talks on the phone anymore. Right? When she left three years ago, people talked on the phone. Now people don't talk on the phone. They're texting, they're emailing, they're, they're communicating in other ways, right? And it, she's, you know, all these little things are just kind of hard to catch up with. And so, you know, this is another problem with looking at just the unemployment rate alone. 
an unemployment rate of 6%, but in which people are short-term unemployed is something much different than an unemployment rate of 6% in which people are long-term unemployed. And so you really have to think about long-term unemployment. And so this gets back to what I was talking about a minute ago, that that's the main question that many economists have right now is this huge shoot up in unemployment that we see. Notice it's come back down, that's great, but is it gonna come all the way back down, right? In other words, is most of this unemployment gonna be short term, which is probably okay. I mean, it's not great, particularly if you're the person who loses your job, but you know, it, it's probably something that we can recover for, for. But how much of this unemployment is gonna be long term? meaning permanent unemployment, in which people can't get their old jobs back and find that whole, whole classes of jobs disappear and that they might be unemployed for very long periods of time. That's a real question. The third thing that our unemployment data ignores is it ignores people who we might consider to be underemployed. And underemployed means you have a job, but you, it's a job that's much below your skill set. So for instance, maybe you want to get you, you would want to have a full-time job of 40 hours a week, but you can only get a job of 15 hours a week, right? If you're working less than 20 hours a week, you're going to be considered unemployed, right? But maybe if you put together two jobs of 15 hours a week so that you work 30 hours a week, then you would be counted as employed. But you might count yourself unemployed because you only have two, you have to work two jobs. To, to pay the bills, right? And so many people might be working two or three jobs to pay the bills. They might consider themselves unemployed because they don't have a primary job. But in our statistics, we're gonna count them as unemployed because they're working more than 20 hours a week. And once again, this has happened a lot during COVID, right? Is a lot of people lost jobs and how have they, what have they done to make ends meet? They've gone into the part-time labor market, right? And they're putting a couple of part-time jobs together. Um, that might, you know, the government's probably going to count them as employed, but they might count themselves as unemployed. So there are a lot of, of I don't know how you want to say this, problems, limitations of the way that we calculate unemployment in the U.S. And so very important to, to keep that in mind, right, is that when we talk about unemployment, um, we're only getting a very approximate view of what unemployment is, right? And there, there's a lot of things that our unemployment rate misses, particularly during a period of time like we're going through now, right? Where I'm not really sure that that 6.7% unemployment rate is really at all a clear indication of just how bad the labor market is, right? Okay, um, now as economists, <clears throat> we want to distinguish between the unemployment rate and what we might call the natural rate of unemployment, okay? So the natural rate of unemployment is really the long run average rate of unemployment. So just like as we talked about the first day of class, economists want to distinguish between short run unemployment and, or I'm sorry, short run output and long run output. Well, for the same reason, we want to distinguish between short-run unemployment and long-run unemployment, right? So short-run unemployment, if I can show you this picture in here, let me get my um, iPad going. So look at this, this graph here. <clears throat> the orange line is the actual rate of unemployment. Notice that there's a lot of variability in the actual rate of unemployment. But over the long run, we can see that there's probably some average rate of unemployment around which the actual rate of unemployment fluctuates, right? And so what is that natural rate of unemployment? The natural rate of unemployment is the long run average rate of unemployment, right? The long run average rate of unemployment. What then is cyclical unemployment? Well, cyclical unemployment 
is the difference between actual unemployment and the natural rate of unemployment, right? So let me write this down for you here. We can think about actual unemployment as part the natural rate of unemployment, right? In other words, the natural rate of unemployment is the long run rate of unemployment, right? So on average, we have, you know, a rate of unemployment that exists period, you know, year after year after year. And we'll talk about where this natural rate of unemployment comes from. But then we have variations around that natural rate. Sometimes unemployment is high, sometimes it is low. And that is the short run rate of unemployment. So in other words, the natural rate of unemployment is associated with trend unemployment, right? That on average, we're gonna have some unemployment. And we're gonna talk about, as I said in a minute, where this natural rate of unemployment comes from. But then around that, we also have additional unemployment that comes from the fact that we have business cycles and recessions. So if you think back to that graph, I'll, I'll flip back to it here. We flip back to this figure, what do we see? We see that the orange line is the actual rate of unemployment. The purple line is the natural rate of unemployment, the average rate. And then how would we calculate the cyclical or the short run component of unemployment? It's just the difference between actual and trend. So this is just the same idea that we talked about in homework number one in the first couple of days of class when we talked about short run output versus long run output. Here, long run output, the equivalent would be the natural rate of unemployment. And short run unemployment would be somewhat equivalent to short run output, right? The difference between actual unemployment and the natural rate of unemployment. And of course, these things are correlated, right? If we define the natural rate of unemployment as U or U star, and the actual rate of unemployment, right, as you, what tends to happen when we are above the natural rate of unemployment, right? If actual unemployment is above the natural rate, that's likely to mean that, oops, sorry. This, if unemployment is greater than the natural rate of unemployment, that's likely to mean that output is less than the natural rate of output, right? Or the long run, the trend level of output. And vice versa, if unemployment is below its natural rate, that's likely to mean that output is above its trend level of output. So the natural rate of un unemployment is different than the cyclical rate of unemployment. So just, just using that same dichotomy that we talked about in terms of output, we can apply that to, um, to unemployment, right? Now, our focus here in chapter seven is the natural rate of unemployment, okay? So we're beginning by talking about the long run. So we're gonna talk about long run unemployment, the natural rate of unemployment. But where we're gonna move toward the end of the week is in the end of the week, we're gonna begin talking about cyclical unemployment, right? When we begin to talk about business cycles. So right now, let's focus on, on the long run, right? Long run unemployment. And talk about why do we have a natural rate of unemployment? Okay, the natural rate of unemployment, why? Why does it exist? <laughs> 
Well, one reason why we have unemployment in the long run is simply because of job churning and job matching. Okay. It is a simple fact that many people lose their job every month and many people find jobs every month. In the US, the average job lasts about 100 months, which is about eight years. And I'm gonna show you some, some data here in a minute though that suggests that this number is falling, right? Your generation can be expected to likely change your job between six and 10 times, right? So I'll say that again. Each of you can likely expect to change your job between six and 10 times between your career, over your career, right? That is a lot of job churning, right? So people lose their jobs all the time. And then, right, so that's the job loss. But then there's job gains, right? That about the 20% of unemployed find a job each month. Okay, so people are losing their jobs and then people are finding their jobs. So let me show you a little bit of data on this. If I can find this. I got way too many things open. Okay, so look at this graph. This is basically looking at job creation rates and job destruction rates. So the job destruction rate is really the rate at which people lose jobs. And the job creation rate is the rate at which job creation, jobs are created. Now notice that there's a lot of similarities between these two things, right? That um, oftentimes the job creation rate and the job destruction rate are roughly the same, right? But then there's some other things to notice here. First off, there are also periods of time when they can be much different. And typically, what do we see happens during a recession? During a recession, job destruction goes up and job creation goes down, and that's where unemployment comes from. There's also something else that's really interesting in this graph, which is that there appears to be a decline in both the job creation rate and the job destruction rate over time. In other words, we're seeing a decline in the amount of job churning. Right, meaning how often people are leaving jobs. And many economists have said that's not necessarily a good, a good deal. Right? That in some sense, job churning is efficient because the more that people leave jobs, the more likely they are to get matched up with a better job. Right? And so to some extent, we don't want people just staying at one job for 50 years. Right? That's probably not efficient for the economy. We want people to have the ability to move around Right, and get to the job that fits them best. That's gonna be best. But the, there appears to be kind of this, this reduction in the amount of job churning that's happening, and many economists have, have worried about this. But anyway, back to our question about unemployment. So what, is, what does job churning say then about unemployment or, or where the natural rate of unemployment comes from? Well. I'm sorry, are you, are you seeing? Yeah, here we go. So according to the, you know, or because of job churning, what we're gonna get is we're gonna get some level of unemployment in the economy. Long-run unemployment comes 
comes from the fact that job separation Long run unemployment comes from the fact that job separation, job separation doesn't always match job creation. So let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. And we can do this by working what's called the bathtub model. Right? the bathtub model of unemployment. What in the world do I mean by the bathtub model of unemployment? <clears throat> well, the bathtub model of unemployment is, is really using the analogy of a bathtub, okay? What happens if the rate of water coming into the bathtub doesn't match the rate of, that water drains out of the bathtub? Well, if there's more water coming into the bathtub than it's draining out, what's going to happen? You're going to get a level of water at the bottom of that bathtub. Well, that's really the same thinking or the, the analogy that you can apply to thinking about long-run unemployment. Where does long-run unemployment come from? It comes from the fact that the amount of people coming, going into the labor market may not match the amount of people who are leaving the labor market. And as a result, you're going to get kind of a stationary level of unemployment within your economy over time if more people are becoming unemployed than are finding jobs. Okay, so that's the bathtub, that's the bathtub analogy. And we can kind of apply this analogy using just a little bit of math to see what it implies about what the long run rate of unemployment is. So this is a very simple model. It's really just two equations. The first is that E plus U is equal to L. E is employed, U is unemployed, and L is the labor force. Right? That one's pretty simple. So in other words, the labor force is either people who are employed or people who are unemployed. And then there's a second equation. This one's a little bit more complicated, but not much. This equation tells us what the change in unemployment is going to be period to period. What's it based on? It's based on two exogenous factors. Here, little s, and this is not little s from our solo model, this is another little s. This is the separation rate. The number of people who leave a job every period. And f is the finding rate. The rate at which people find a job every period. So what's S times E? It's just the number of people who lose a job. And what's F times U? It's the number of people who find a job. So what's the change in unemployment? It's just the number of people who lose a job minus the number of people who find a job, right? That's pretty simple. That's pretty simple. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's the model. It's just these two equations. Now all we have to do is show what's the unemployment rate in this model, okay? Well, what should be true in the long run? 
just like in the solo model, at the natural rate of unemployment, in other words, in the long run, we should be at a steady state. Where the change in unemployment is equal to zero, right? So in the, at the natural rate, in other words, in the long run, we should be at a point where the unemployment rate is not changing. So if the unemployment rate is equal to zero, what does that mean? This should be true. Okay. I'm going to put a star here to denote the natural rate of unemployment. Okay, let's simplify this down here. What's E? E is equal to this, L minus U. Okay, or this. Nobody's called me on it. I made a mistake all the way back. For some reason, I put pluses here, right? Remember that these should be minuses. Sorry about that. Okay. You all with me so far? Let's put this over here on this other side. So moving, the, oops, moving this over here. So the number of people unemployed should equal S times L divided by S plus F. Now notice here, this is the number of people unemployed. What's the unemployment rate? The unemployment rate is the number of people unemployed divided by the number of people in the labor force. So L drops out. And that's what our unemployment rate is. The unemployment rate is just a ratio of the separation rate to the separation plus finding rate. It's really so simple, right? It's just saying that our natural rate of unemployment is best on is based on the rate of separation and the rate of finding. So let's use a real world example. If we look at data from 2019 in the US, what do we see? The separation rate is about 0.01 a month. Remember I told you that the average job lasts about 100 months. So in other words, about 1% of the population or 1% of the labor force loses their job every month. That's what the US data is. And I also told you that 20% of unemployed find a job every month. So F is about 
So what's the natural rate of unemployment? Point oh one divided by point oh one plus point two, which is point oh four eight or four point eight percent. Can you scroll up just a little bit so I can see the equation at the top? Yes. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Sure. Is there ever going to be any times that there's going to be like circumstantial evidence that won't be accounted for in this formula, but it actually affects the unemployment rate? Oh, sure. Right. This is just a model, right? <laughs> so a model is a simplified version of reality. So yeah, this, this model is not including a whole bunch of things. It's just simply saying that one way you can think about the natural rate of unemployment is just a function of the separation and finding rate, right? Now there's a whole bunch of reasons why the separation and finding rate would change over time, but this model is not trying to explain that. There could be other things that impact unemployment in the short run, right? But you know, once again, this, this is a model that has a, a very narrow question, right? How do we explain the natural rate of unemployment? And this model is saying the simplest way to explain the natural rate of unemployment is just simply by looking at the separation and finding rate. Those, those, that's the primary determinant of what the, the natural rate of unemployment is. So, yeah, I mean, listen, there's a reason why this is a, a, a widely known model in economics is it has a very simple explanation and it's actually, you know, not unreasonable explanation of what, the, what determines the natural rate of unemployment. So if you know the separation rate and you know the finding rate, you can figure out what the natural rate of unemployment is. And so, you know, here's a, you might think of it as a back of the envelope calculation, right, a rough idea. Um, based on this data, um, the bathtub model will predict that the natural rate of unemployment is about 5%. If you go back and you look at that figure I showed you before, in fact, let me switch back to that. Jeez, it's so weird how this doesn't always work. Let me try sharing this again. So if you go back and you look at this figure that I showed you, notice here that, yeah, you know, the bathtub models of it, the bathtub models prediction of a natural rate of unemployment about 5% actually is, it appears to be fairly accurate, right? I mean, what we tend to see is that unemployment tends to fluctuate around a number that's pretty close to 5%. Sometimes it's been a little bit higher than 5%. Sometimes it's been a little bit lower than 5%. But in general, 5% is probably a pretty reasonable estimate for what the natural rate of unemployment is. And bath, bath public model explains that pretty simply. Okay. Now, the next question is, well, what determines the separation and finding rate, right? <laughs> the bathtub model takes these things as exogenous, but what determines these exogenous factors of the separation and finding rate. Let's talk about a couple of examples of things that can impact separation and finding in a minute, but why don't we take a break first? So um, maybe a little bit after 10 o'clock, we'll come back and we'll talk about why this separation and finding rate changes over time and why it might be different across countries. Okay, so see you in about five minutes.
Oh, sorry. A little bit longer break than I promised. Okay, so I, I one or two of you jumped in here late. Let me just kind of repeat a couple of things. Uh, first off, remember that homework number one is due this afternoon at one o'clock, all right? So please get that to me um, by then. And then remember, we will not have afternoon class this afternoon, okay? So you're off this afternoon. Tomorrow we will definitely have class in the morning where we will talk about chapter eight. And we will also have class in the afternoon where we will finish up whatever material we need to finish up in chapter eight and then also talk about the exam. So we'll, we will have some time tomorrow afternoon um, to both review homework number two, to talk about the exam. If there's anything you want to, any questions you have in terms of reviewing or just questions about the subject of the exam, we'll definitely have time to do that tomorrow afternoon, okay? Okay, so um, before break, we were talking about the bathtub model, right? We, we, figured out the, the bathtub model. The bathtub model basically says that the natural rate of unemployment is a function of the separation and finding rate. So I guess the next question is, well, what determines the separation and finding rate within a country? So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the determinants of the separation and finding rate. So let's begin here by thinking about what we could call a classical, perfectly competitive labor market. This is the classical, perfectly competitive labor market that you've undoubtedly seen in principles, right? In principles of micro or per principles of macro, right? And so when you talked about the labor market in, uh, in, in principles, we talked about a market where there's the quantity of labor and there's the price of labor, which is the wage. And then we had a labor demand curve. This is similar to the labor demand curve that we derived in chapter four, right? We actually derived this labor demand curve. If you remember in chapter four, we showed that this labor demand curve is where the wage is equal to the marginal product of labor. And then we have, in, in chapter four, we had a vertical labor supply curve, but you could also think about having a more realistic labor supply curve where labor supply goes up as the wage goes up, as opposed to just vertical where, it, as we did in chapter four, where labor supply is just fixed at the rate of the population. In other words, everybody works. Here's a situation where people can choose to join the labor force. They're more likely to join the labor force if the wage goes up. And it's the intersection between these that determines the equilibrium wage. Are labor markets perfectly competitive? Not in the short run, they're not. But in the long run, they are. And this classical model, while not perfect, does allow us to think about some of the long run determinants of the separation and finding rate. One of the things to notice here in this classical labor market is that all unemployment is voluntary. What do I mean by voluntary? People choose to be unemployed in this model. There's nobody who's willing to work at W star who can't get a job, right? So in other words, if there's somebody up here at this point of the labor supply curve, they're not working. But the only reason they're not working is the wage is not high enough to get them to enter the labor market, okay? So the only kind of unemployment that we have here is the kind of unemployment where people choose not to work. They are voluntarily unemployed. As I said, is that a good description of all unemployment in the world? I don't think so. 
I think there's a lot of people who would like to work at the equilibrium wage and can't get it. So, you know, when we talk about cyclical or short run unemployment, we're going to want to move past this assumption that labor markets are perfectly competitive and that all unemployment is voluntary. But for right now, talking about the long run, uh, this simple model, while, you know, definitely not capturing all un unemployment, does help us to think about why unemployment might change a little bit over time. So here's just some things that shift things that shift or change the separation and finding rate. For instance, uh, some people will point to taxes on labor supply, right? For instance, um, an income tax. What does an income tax do? It essentially reduces the return to working. So let's say that we have a classical labor market and there's an increase in the income tax. Well, now what's going to be true about people's take home income? It's going to go down and that's going to reduce the incentive to work. And so with the reduction in the incentive to work, we should see a reduction in labor supply. This will drive up the wage But most importantly, it's going to reduce F, right? It's going to reduce the finding rate because fewer people are going to accept jobs. And this reduction in the finding rate is also going to increase the unemployment rate, right? So many people, particularly people with a more, I would say, in terms of political um, beliefs, people more on the conservative or, or um, yeah, I'll say conservative side of this political spectrum, believe that this is one of the big causes of unemployment. They believe that people are very sensitive to taxes. And so when taxes on income goes up, that's a big incentive that discourages people from getting in the labor force. Um, I'll just say as an aside, there's actually not really great evidence that taxes are a big influence over the finding rate. In other words, people aren't nearly as sensitive to income taxes in their decision to work as you might think, right? But that's, that's a very much an aside. Um, that's something that could impact the, the separate, or I'm sorry, the finding rate. Just like taxes could impact the, the finding rate, they could also impact the separation rate through taxes or regulation on firms. on firms and businesses. So now what happens if the tax falls not on a firm, I'm sorry, not on the, the workers, but the tax falls on an individual or an individual firm. Right, so let's say there's an increase in business taxes, such as an increase in corporate profits. What's that going to do? Well, that's going to reduce the firm's incentive to produce. As a result, that should reduce labor demand. And when labor demand goes down, the separation rate will go up, right? Meaning firms are going to lay off workers. And an increase in the separation rate should increase the natural rate of unemployment. So differences in taxes and regulation over time or between countries is probably one of the things that, that plays some role in changing the natural rate of unemployment, the long run rate of unemployment over time. Let's talk about a couple of other examples here of things that might change this. Oops. 
the prices of inputs also is likely to impact the natural rate of unemployment. For instance, what happens if there's an increase in the price of capital? What impact does that have? in the market for labor. Well, first off, is capital a substitute or a complement for labor? Do we use capital to replace labor or do we use capital to supplement labor? Well, in this model, capital is a complement to labor, right? More capital makes labor more productive. So an increase in the price of capital leads to a reduction in capital. And this actually reduces the marginal product of labor. Less capital means labor is less productive. That's going to reduce labor demand. So labor demand shifts down. The reduction in labor demand leads to an increase in the separation rate and increases unemployment. So here, uh, changes in, in the price of capital, because capital is a complement, not a substitute for labor. That's something that a lot of people forget, right? A lot of people think of capital nowadays as robots that steal your jobs, but in reality, capital makes labor more productive. Capital makes labor more attractive to hire. And so if capital goes up in price, that's actually gonna make labor less attractive to hire. That's gonna increase your separation rates and increase unemployment. One final thing here that might, and of course, this is not an exhaustive list. Okay, this is not everything in the world that could impact the separation and finding rate. Just kind of talking about a couple of, of the more obvious things or the things that we should, you know, kind of think of, think on or most obvious examples. But one last thing that likely impacts the separation and finding rate is how generous unemployment benefits are. Okay, we're gonna talk about some specifics about this here in a minute, <laughs> but it's pretty clear that more generous benefits reduce labor supply, right? The more generous that benefits are, the more likely that people are to spend a little bit longer outside of the labor force, right? When they lose the job, it does encourage more searching. So the fact that it increases unemployment, as we're gonna show, is bad, but that the fact that it increases more search could actually be a good thing, right? Because we do want people to search for the best part possible jobs. We don't want people to feel like they have to take the first job that comes along, even if it's not a good match for them. And so unemployment benefits are actually you know, one of these areas where there's a lot of debate among economists as to how generous benefits should be. We want benefits to be somewhat generous because we want to encourage people to look for jobs when they lose them. But we don't want them to be too generous because what happens if they're too generous? It reduces the finding rate and it increases the natural rate of unemployment. So if you look at countries around the world, let me show you this screen here. Or a figure. This is looking at unemployment rates in the US, in the blue, Japan in the red, and the euro area in the green. You'll see that there's quite different 
quite significant differences in unemployment rates between these regions. A lot of it can be attributed to differences in labor market institutions, particularly unemployment benefits. So in the US, we have what's called a 50-50 system. Typically, if you lose benefits, or I'm sorry, if you lose your job, you get half a year's benefits for at half your previous income. Okay, so it's a 50-50 system. 50% 50 of your previous income or 50% in a year. That's how it typically is. Now, during certain periods of time, Congress and the president can extend benefits, and that's one of the things that's happened here recently, is now during this COVID crisis, you can actually get extended benefits. But typically, right, we have a 50-50 system. By world standards, the US system is not particularly generous. In Europe, most European countries have much more gen generous systems in, in which you can get unemployment benefits for much longer periods of time, and you actually get much better benefits, right? In um, Sweden, for instance, you can actually qualify for vacation benefits while you're unemployed. In other words, they'll help pay for your vacation while you're unemployed. So, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty generous. And it's actually, pretty obviously, a pretty big incentive to remain unemployed or at least search longer. And so what do we see here is that this tends to lead to higher unemployment in Europe. And you can actually see when unemployment went up in, the, in Europe. It, unemployment in Europe used to be a little bit lower than in the United States. But where it made a big jump was in the 70s when there was a big change in most European unemployment systems that became much more generous. Japan actually has a lower level of unemployment than the US. But in part, that's because Japan has a much, much different labor market institutions. Japan has a system of lifetime employment in which it's very difficult to fire workers. So on one hand, you might say, well, that's great. If you can't fire workers, that's gonna reduce unemployment. And yes, it probably does reduce unemployment in Japan. The flip side is, it probably also reduces productivity in Japan. Because in many cases, you have workers who are not very good at their job, but once they have it, it's very difficult to get rid of them. And so, you know, once again, to say that unemployment benefits lead to higher, lead to higher unemployment does not necessarily mean that they're bad, right? Unemployment benefits create both positive things and negative things. And we have to kind of think through these as economists and you know, hopefully as a society, in order to kind of balance those things out to pick the appropriate level of unemployment benefits. So, you know, many, many economists say that, you know, despite its low unemployment, Japan actually has a pretty dysfunctional labor market because there it's just too hard to become unemployed, right? Making it too hard to become unemployed is, can be just as bad for your economy as making it too easy to be unemployed. Um, also, another big difference between these areas is in terms of labor regulation, right? So I was just talking about Japan. Japan has a very, very um, intensively late regulated labor market, which makes it very hard to hire workers. But a labor market in which it's hard to, to I'm sorry, it makes it very hard to fire workers. But a labor market that makes it hard to fire workers is also a labor market that makes it hard to hire workers. To give you an example of this, some of you might have heard me use this example. This is not from Europe, but this is from Argentina. I had a friend, kind of not really a family member, but kind of a family member who lived in Argentina, um, still does, and had a longtime maid, house, housemaid that lived in their house. And Argentina passed a labor re regulation that said if you, if you, if you, fire somebody, I'm sorry, no, let me back up. If somebody retires, they don't get any money from you, right? So in other words, if somebody retires and they've been your employee, they can just leave with no essentially separation fee. But if you fire somebody, you have to pay them a separation fee equal to 50% of their annual income. And so maybe you can see where this is going. As the housekeeper got older, and moved to retirement, she wanted to quit, but she didn't want to retire because she would get nothing. 
she wanted to get fired. And so you can kind of imagine some of the things she did, including breaking things, not performing on the job, not showing up, basically trying to get fired so that she would get half a year's worth of income, right? Um, that's not really a, a particularly efficient system, right? <laughs> when, you, when you try to encourage, when people have incentives to get fired as opposed to quitting. And so in many countries, we, they have kind of these, um, these crazy labor regulations that on one hand seem to make it hard to get fired, but once again, if you make it too hard to get fired, you're also going to make it very hard to get hired in the first place. So anyway, um, one final difference between many countries that impacts unemployment rates is unions, right? Unions you basically use the power of organization to increase wages. These higher wages also lead to more unemployment. Once again, that does not mean that unions are bad. Unions can create positive effects, right? For instance, higher wages, that's a positive. But they also create negative effects, such as unemployment for those people outside of the union. And so once again, unions are, are you know, have this kind of complex um, network of costs and benefits that really need to be worked through. But it's pretty clear that in most countries that have higher unionization rates have higher unemployment rates. What about migration? Does migration lead to more unemployment? Let's talk about that a little bit, migration and immigration. Does immigration lead to unemployment? Obviously, immigration is a pretty hot political topic, right? And uh, we all know that President Trump and his supporters believe that immigration is really at the root of most evils here in the United States, including the idea that immigrants steal American jobs, right? And so let's kind of evaluate that. Before we actually get into this question of does migration steal American jobs, I just want to return to why there's such pressure for migration. And it really gets back to that citizenship premium that we've talked about a couple of times before. There are huge economic incentives to migrate. Right? There are huge economic incentives to migrate to richer countries like the US. As we talked about, somebody from the Congo can increase their income by a factor of 92 by, increasing, by migrating to the United States. So that's huge, right? There are huge economic incentives. Now the question is, does migration increase unemployment in the US? Does migration to the U.S. increase U.S. unemployment? So the argument that it does is really just applying this simple classical labor market. So critics critics of migration and immigration say, listen, the economics are so simple. What happens if you have more people? more people is going to increase this labor supply curve and what's going to happen to wages, right? It's going to reduce wages. And many people will leave the labor market. Right? So in other words, as wages go down, many people leave, leave the, the labor market. 
So while the total quantity of people employed goes up, employment among people who are here originally is going to go down, right? Because many of those new jobs, a lot of all of those new jobs are going to be taken by migrants. And so you hear this argument that migrants come, they're willing to work at lower wages, they push the wages down for everybody else. This is what you might call the, the simplistic or back of the envelope argument as to why migration is not such a good thing. Here's the problem with this argument. Economists, many, many economists have looked at this empirically and tried to evaluate this empirically. Do migrants increase unemployment? Do migrants reduce wages? And surprisingly, the answer is no. Or somewhat surprisingly. Immigration does not reduce wages and increase unemployment. And so the question is why? Why is that? What, what's wrong with this simple model? And I think the answer is that yes, it's true that immigration increases labor supply. but it also increases labor demand. And to understand that, we have to go back to what we talked about last week. Leaks and matches, the creation of ideas. That there is a lot of evidence that immigration is a crucial factor to increasing aggregate productivity. Many immigrants bring with them large amounts of human capital. So many immigrants, right, I mean, I think, you know, the, the kind of, um, the caricature of many critics of immigration is that immigrants come here and they're the poorest, the least educated, they have nothing to bring with them. In fact, if you actually look at who tends to immigrate to the US, it tends to be higher human capital people, right? So in other words, people who have higher levels of human capital, people who have better experience, people who have more marketable skills, tend to be the people who migrate to the United States. And so when they migrate to the US, they're not just bringing themselves, but they're bringing human capital that helps to increase aggregate productivity. So in other words, if you think about what happens in our labor market when you have immigration, it, yes, it does increase labor supply as critics talk about, but it also increases labor demand. And so what's the net impact? The net impact is there's very little change in wage. But over time, by increasing aggregate productivity, it leads to a lot of growth. And so over time, right, what immigration brings us is more possibility of growth. And this is very consistent with what we talked about in Roma, right? One of the things we saw in the Roma model is that the more population you have, the more ideas you generate, and the faster you grow. And this, there's a lot of empirical evidence to suggest this, a lot of empirical evidence to suggest that migration is a, is a net positive for a country, not a net negative, right, as many critics charge. So one of the most, I think, persuasive or arguments for immigration is just this fact, which is kind of amazing. I think maybe I mentioned this fact um, last week, but if you look at the 500 largest U.S. companies, 
okay, the 500 largest U.S. companies, 43% of them were founded by immigrants or the children of immigrants. Think about it, that's amazing. More than 40% of our largest companies were founded by immigrants or the children of immigrants. Of the top 25 firms, more than half of them were founded by immigrants or the children of immigrants. Nine of our 13 most valuable brands in the US were founded by immigrants or the children of immigrants, right? Henry Forbes, Steve Jobs, Sergey Brin from Google, Jeff Bezos are all children of immigrants, right? So this idea that somehow we're getting screwed over by immigrants, it just doesn't pass the smell test, right? And so, you know, I, I try in this class not to get too political, but you know, you talk about, you know, what's one thing that we could do to grow faster as a country, um, this appears to be a pretty strong, you know, argument, a pretty clear factor in, in some of the, th in, 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 in a relatively easy thing to change, right? To expand our immigration, to allow more of these people to come to the U.S. because they don't just bring their bodies, they bring a lot of human capital that over time, it, you know, fuels the ideas creation that ultimately drives growth. Um, one last thing here to talk about in chapter seven. And this is a topic, honestly, this is a, a topic, sorry, that if we had an entire day to talk about, that would probably not be enough. So the fact I'm saving this for the last 15 minutes of class means that this is necessarily gonna be truncated. But it's, it's a topic that's worth talking about, particularly because we are all in college, obviously. <clears throat> but what's happening here with the college wage premium? In other words, there is a growing premium There's a growing premium for a college education. And by premium, I mean the wage that a college educated worker gets versus the wage that, for instance, a high school worker gets. So to look at some data here, Here's looking at the college wage premium in the United States. So the green line is the college wage premium, right? And by premium here, uh, we're really looking how much more somebody who has a college education gets paid relative to somebody who does not have a college education. So today that college education premium is a little bit less than 100%, right? So in other words, you get paid on average about twice as much having a college education relative to just having a high school education. The amazing thing about this is at the same time that the premium has gone up, more and more Americans have a college education. And at some level, that's kind of surprising, right? Because as more people have a college education, shouldn't that increase the supply of college educated workers? And if the supply of college educated workers go up, shouldn't that reduce wages for college educated workers, right? No, no, that's not what's happening at all. That's not what's happening at all. How do we explain this? How do we explain the fact that as more people become college educated, we are getting, we are still seeing wages go up? Well, Let's think about a simple kind of two labor markets. Okay, let's think about a labor market for those who have high school education. In other words, we could kind of disparagingly call this the low-skilled labor market or less skilled. It's probably a little bit nicer way of saying it. 
And then we have a college educated labor market. In other words, this is the labor market for higher skilled workers. And notice here that I've drawn this so that there's a premium. College educated workers get paid more than high school educated workers. Now, what's happening over time? Well, what's happening over time is we actually are seeing more and more college educated workers, right? So in other words, labor supply is going down here in the high school educated market and it's going up here in the college educated market. Shouldn't this be driving the wages closer together? In other words, shouldn't that college wage premium be disappearing? Well, it should if this is the only thing that's going on. If this is the only thing going on, then wages would be going up in high school educated and they'd be going down for college educated until they got closer together. But that's not the only thing that's going on. There's something else very important going on. And what is it? Obviously, there is a huge increase in labor demand for college educated and a decline, a relative decline for less educated workers. And so that, oops, what did I draw back there? So what this has done is that decline in labor demand has driven down wages for less skilled. It's driven up wages for higher skilled, completely offsetting which any changes in labor supply and so what happens to the college wage premium? It's gotten bigger. So in other words, this argument here is arguing the increase in labor demand for college educated workers is driving this rise in the wage premium. Okay. What's driving this increase in the labor demand for college educated workers? Well, let's talk about a couple of things here very briefly. <clears throat> And as I said, I mean, for each one of these, I could spend an hour talking about, right? There's so much to say about each one of these. So I, I, I feel kind of bad that we're, we're kind of cutting this short. But there's, there, there's a number of factors that are driving up the labor demand for college workers. But let me just kind of briefly hit on some of the simplest ones. The first, It's just a function of the kind of technology that we have today. Today's new technologies are much more human capital intensive than they used to be. So think about technologies from the early 1900s, such as electrification. Electrification, meaning putting electricity into businesses and houses, improved the productivity of almost everybody, right? A janitor and a CEO saw their, their productivity go up. What are we seeing about today's new technologies, such as artificial intelligence? Is that changing the nature of the, job, of the job that a janitor does? No, no. It's primarily impacting only people who have jobs in human capital intensive industries, such as services. A lot of information technology, because it's information, is really only impacting people that are in service industries. 
So you want to know why manufacturing in the U.S. is struggling. A lot of it is because there's really not been a lot of technological advances <laughs> in manufacturing, right? A lot of today's technology really is primarily impacting services. And services tend to be more human capital intensive than, than other low-skilled jobs. So yeah, this is a huge one, right? Just the nature of today's technology is fundamentally changing what kind of skills you need. Also, globalization is quite clear that what kind of goods do we have comparative advantage in? What kind of goods do we tend to make here in a globalized economy? We tend to make high human capital types of goods. Right? The goods that require a lot of human capital are the, good, the, the industries that are thriving in the US because we, they don't have as much competition from abroad. Right? For instance, once again, services. Right? The US is, is dominant in the production of services. But how about in manufacturing? We're not so dominant, right? We're not so dominant. So in other words, we face most, most manufacturing-based industries face a lot tougher global competition than US service-based industries, right? Where we have big advantages. Also, we talked about the fact that we have moved to, as we move to a service-based economy, we've moved to um, uh, using more and more intangible capital. Intangible capital basically means ideas. So nowadays, you know, think about a company like Starbucks. What's the main capital that Starbucks uses? Well, sure, they have buildings and they have espresso machines, but the primary form of capital that Starbucks uses is human capital. The knowledge, the how-to, the experience, the quality control, the training, right? That is the main thing, the main form of capital that a place like Starbucks leverages. And all that kind of capital is primarily used by people who already have a lot of human capital, right? It gets back to what we were talking about in the Romer model on Friday. Remember in the Romer model, we talked about who's gonna make the most ideas? Countries where there's already a lot of ideas. And who's gonna make the most use of capital today? It's people who already have capital, right? You're gonna use human capital more if you already have a lot of human capital. And so what this means is that all of these things are putting increasing pressure on creating human capital in our workforce. Those workers who are able to accumulate human capital, and one of the important ways of doing that is to go to college, are seeing their wages go up. What happens for those who can't do that? They're seeing their wages stagnate, right? And one of the implications of this is growing inequality in the United States, right? And a lot of this inequality is simply driven by simple economics, right? That economics uh, and the way that technology is advancing is putting a huge premium on some people's jobs and very little premium <laughs> on other people's jobs, right? So in the interest of time, if you just give me a couple more minutes, I want to share with you just one figure. And once again, I had this big, long presentation where I'd show you a whole bunch of data. <laughs> but I'm going to skip all that data and just show you one figure that kind of raised this idea about why some of, these, why some of the ways that technology is changing is fundamentally impacting our labor markets and then impacting inequality. Okay, so this is a bit of a complicated graph, but I, I think we can get it. 
So on the horizontal axis is what income percentile people fall into. Are you in the poorest 10%, the 10 to 20, or all the way up here on the right, are you in the 90th percentile, meaning the, the richest 10%? And then on the vertical axis, it's shown how, how much income, for people in each of these percentiles, how much have they seen their income going up? Okay, so if you're in the bottom 10%, how much have you seen your income go up over the last 34 years? Let's first look at this yellow line. This is looking in 1980. So if we did this calculation in 1980, what do we see? In 1980, the poorest 10% actually had faster income growth than the richest 10%. I'll say that again, in 1980, if we look at the previous 34 years, the poor actually did better than the rich. They were catching up. We were getting less income inequality in the 30, 34 years leading up to 1980. In other words, that post-war era, right, basically between the mid-40s and 1980s was a period of slowing income inequality in the U.S. And that was often known as kind of a golden age of economic prosperity, right, where everybody was kind of, of, of everyone was kind of feeling the gains to the increases in, in prosperity. But look at how this thing has changed when we look at the 34 years between 2014. In other words, this period between 1980 and 2014. We're seeing almost no growth among the, the bottom 10%. And we're seeing astronomical growth among the richest, right? This is the age of inequality. And what's driving this inequality? Well, part of it is technology. Part of it is technology and the growing wage premium for people with college educated. So if you have a college education, if you have a unique set of skills, you are probably doing very well in this economy. But if you don't have a college education, you don't have a unique set of skills, you are probably struggling. Couple that with other public policy changes that have taken place in the US, such as our tax rate has become much less progressive so that we are actually taxing the rich less and we're taxing the poor more than we were in 1980. You add that to the mix and that's why you see this growing inequality problem. So there's so much more that I could say to this. Like I said, I really feel bad for just kind of jamming this in in the last 10 or 15 minutes of class because there's, there's a ton to be said. But um, I just say that as a, as a brief introduction to this topic of why we see growing income inequality. I kind of view this as, as one of the fundamental challenges uh, in macroeconomics today, is what are we gonna do about this? Because I think it's not only having economic effects, but it's clearly having social effects. It's having impacts on public health, it's having impacts on future education, it's having impacts on our politics, right? It's, it's one of the fundamental problems of our society. What are we gonna do about income inequality, right? So much more to talk about this. I, I didn't even touch on the basis that uh, there's also a big income inequality between men and women, right? And what it causes that, right? Um, women's access to certain forms of technology is a crucial question. Income inequality as it pertains to race is a huge question. I'd love to talk about that. I, I, I feel embarrassed that we're not, but th there's a lot more to be said here. Um, and hopefully, if you take some more classes from me in the future, we'll get to it. Right? Um, but, but that's all we have time for um, today. So anyway, I apologize for running a little bit late, but you got this afternoon off, so I don't feel too bad for you. Um, thank you for your attention. Send me some emails if you have questions about homework number two or anything else. But remember, um, send it in your homework number two by one o'clock. You'll get it back probably tonight. We'll talk about it tomorrow, all right? Okay, thank you all. Have a good afternoon.